From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. It's the home stretch in Rhode Island's first congressional race as a dozen Democrats vie to replace David Cicilline in Congress. It's been a week of forums, internal polls, and unexpected revelations. Thousands have already cast their ballots, but many are still making up their mind as the candidates prepare to meet for a live primetime debate here on WPRI 12 next Tuesday. This week on Newsmakers, what you need to know with the political roundtable. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me, as always, 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi, and joining us for the roundtable, Joe Fleming, 12 News Political Analyst, and we welcome back Steph Machado, reporter from the Boston Globe. Good to have you guys. Thanks for having me back. All right, so a lot of candidates running to replace uh, David Cicilline, and it's been really hard to know uh, where this race stands mm -hmm. so far because there's been no independent polling so far. But we did get possibly a glimpse, Joe, into yep. it with an independent uh, poll, excuse internal. me, internal poll. <laughs> right. uh, Gabe Amo, Democrat running, obviously released his internal poll results. And why don't we take a look at some of the top line here. We have Aaron Regenberg at 28 percent. The Amo campaign says that Gabe Amo's at 19 percent. And then Sabina Matos and Sandra Cano are both at 11 percent. So, Joe, all the caveats about this being an internal campaign poll, again, not an independent yep. poll. That being said, what what does this tell you? Well, first, the good news was they gave us the whole poll. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like they just gave head-to-head -head numbers. It says to me that Aaron Regenberg is in a strong position right now. They're showing him up by nine points. The poll is then about three weeks out from the primary. And it shows that Gabe is closing the gap, but he still has a long ways to go. And let's be clear, Aaron Regenberg at 28%. 28, right. You can win with that number Absolutely in, in, in this, this race. race. With 12 candidates running, you can win 28%. They have the undecided down to 15%. Keep in mind... The number you're showing of Regenberg at 28, that is what the people who said they were undecided and then they pushed them to see who would you vote for if you had a vote today. That's how the number went up. Originally, Aaron started at 24% and Gabe was at 16%. So this includes the liens uh, in this number that you're when, showing. When would, does anybody know when they were in the field? 15th, uh, 15th to 17th. So it's, a, it's quite recent. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. fresh. Ted, let's peel back the curtain a little bit. Uh, you heard there were some disagreements inside the AMO campaign about whether or not to release the poll. Yeah, this was uh, this was a big fight uh, among uh, the staff, the consultants, the candidate, and uh, the kind of kitchen cabinet people advising AMO who are supporting him. Uh, because the thing was, and I think part of why the reporters are at least willing to entertain that, you know, broadly this might be a bit of where the race stands is because this was not one of those polls done on the cheap, real quick, in order to get a press release. This was done because they wanted to know where the race stands and didn't initially want to release it, and there was pressure from others saying, to tell me the argument against, though. For if, if you're the AMO campaign and you're gonna put out He's in second place with much stronger numbers when everybody else, conventional wisdom, mm -hmm. was that he was in fourth, maybe even fifth place. Why would you not release well, the poll? Well, uh, and that's what the people who were pressuring uh, Amo and others to release it said. They were like, you got to tell people if you think you're in second. But first and foremost, I think campaigns generally, you know, Joe knows this, information is the coin of the realm. And do you want to yeah. hand out your, frankly, expensive information, uh, we're going to talk about money later, uh, to the other candidates and tell them? They are in this poll also very much crowning Aaron Regenberg as a strong front runner. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not necessarily helpful if you're in second. Uh, and, uh, you know, people just don't necessarily want to automatically give out what they feel is, you know, something valuable okay. to them. But I think the argument that won the day was the AMO campaign realized if they don't get across the idea that he's a credible candidate to the voters, he could be Helena Folks, where we heard after last year's Democratic gubernatorial primary voters said to us, oh, I, I didn't realize she was the second choice. So I voted for Nellie Gorbea if I wasn't a Dan McKee voter. I wish I'd known that Helena Folks was the strong mm -hmm. one. I voted for her. So AMO's campaign is trying to say, if you don't want Aaron Regenberg, you know, you should vote for me, not Sabina. Right. Steph, um, one of the things that stood out to me in this poll was the what we call the favorability numbers. And for Sabina Matos, they were not good. If you combine the very favorable and somewhat favorable, she's at 29% favorable, 44% unfavorable. But the real number that stood out to me is her very unfavorable number was 26%. Uh, that is the highest of all the categories. Um, you know, and I really, we should reinforce, these are likely Democratic mm. primary yep. voters, right? This isn't a general electorate. So what 
what does this tell you? Is this the fallout of the signature scandal, you think? Yeah, I definitely think that's a factor here. The last internal numbers we had seen were from before that scandal happened. And so everyone was sort of still considering her a front runner, but really sort of hungry for any numbers that could show us how she was doing post signature fallout. You know, and Matos is trying to um, portray herself as the alternative to Aaron Regenberg. She had a news conference this week saying, if you don't want Aaron for, here's a long list of reasons that she listed, <laughs> I'm the one to vote for. And so this poll sort of counters that and says, well, actually it could be Amo, it could be Kano. It's almost like you read my mind because we have a little bit <laughs> of that. You could work here. <laughs> you, could do, you could work in television stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, we had a little bit from that press conference when Matos came out and asked for people to, uh, to step out of the race. Why don't we take a listen to that? I'm asking the other candidates if they can take a look at their uh, chances and ask them to support my campaign so we can consolidate the Democratic field. I haven't asked any other candidate directly. I never asked Nick to lift the race. He makes his decision. I ask him after he makes his decision uh, to uh, support my campaign. Maybe so if, it, call. if yes, if any other candidate drop out of, of the race, I'll be the first one calling them and asking them for the support. Sabina Matos and standing next to her is Nick Audiello, who was a Democrat in the race until he dropped out and, and supported, uh, supported uh, Sabina Matos. So is Matos, Joe, here just conceding that Aaron Regenberg is a front runner? She definitely was. And now we have polling that shows the exact same thing. I think what we're going to see is the candidates now over these next nine days or so to start geeing up on Aaron Regenberg, trying to bring his number down to the low 20s again so they can move up. So I expect to see uh, negative ads on TV, possibly IEs. Also, negative mailings coming you out. Should say independent, independent expenditures. And I also expect to see the debate on Tuesday night. The candidates going after him. If not, he's going to be in a very strong position if they don't try to bring his number down. Is anyone going to drop out? Is anyone going to follow her advice? I don't think so. I mean, unless they drop out for scandal reasons or some reason that's other than dropping out to consolidate with other candidates. I just think if they were all going to get together and say, let's all support one person against Regenberg, that they would have done it by now. Mm -hmm. I, I just agree with Steph. I think the time I expected consolidation is starting to pass. I mean, granted, and I've used this frame a lot, but covering that fourth district race in Massachusetts in 2020 to replace Joe Kennedy, which reminds me so much of this with very crowded field pressure to consolidate. And by the way, one with 23 percent of the vote by Jake Gockenclaw. So Regenberg's already beating the number that got Jake Gockenclaw to Congress in the AMO poll. Uh, in that case, we did see people starting to drop out in this window by now who were getting a measurable share of the vote and back. Jesse Mermel, who was indeed, it turned out, the leading alternative to Jake Auchincloss, but not enough of them did it, and it, it probably happened too late. So it's definitely starting to feel like it might be too late here for that to make a big impact. And they, and they were actually asked at the Providence Journal Public's radio debate, they asked each candidate, are you going to drop out? And they all said no. So. Um, and it wouldn't be a newsmaker's without an MA04 reference. Thank from you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, uh, you know, Joe, the other person in that poll that was in the top four that we've been highlighting yep. is Sandra Cano. Uh, there's some positive buzz surrounding her campaign. Yep. Uh, she's, again, tied with Matos at 11 percent in that internal uh, poll from the AMO campaign. But she has less money. She, and her, her campaign is, is really leaning into the grassroots mm -hmm. strategy. Does that work in an election well, like this? Well, an election like this with the turnout is very small, it looks like it could have a big impact on it. She's lacking money, so she has very little TV, but she does have some. But she has a lot of endorsements from mayors around the 1st Congressional District, from a lot of senators, council people, school committee people. Those endorsements in this race could have an impact. And my understanding is they have a strong ground game. So does Aaron Regelberg, I understand. Mm -hmm. Her ground game could have an impact because we don't know where the turnout's going to be on primary day. Some areas you might expect a high turnout might be a low turnout. In other areas, if they can get the vote out, could have a big impact. Um, and we're going to talk about money. Poor Ted had a very late night last <laughs> night calculating all that. But before we it. do that, I want to talk about um, Aaron Regenberg because you brought him up in the, in the ground game from that poll. He seems to be the front runner. And, and the other candidates seem to think he is as well because of how they treat him mm -hmm. on the debate stage. They really go after him. And I want to play one of those moments in a second from the Pro Joe Public's radio debate. But first, I think you need to get the viewers <laughs> up to speed on what 
this red box scandal is all about. Yeah, so classic, uh, my old friend Scotty McKay always says, how many voters know what a red box is? Right. But it, it's this new thing, it was an issue for Nelly Gorbea last year where uh, candidates are not allowed under federal law, it's illegal to coordinate directly with super PACs. So to get around that, be kind of cute, they put up a page on their campaign website, sometimes literally inside a red box, that says voters in the first district need to hear or need to see and need to hear means like a radio ad. Needs to see means a TV ad. Mm -hmm. That Aaron Regenberg is a strong progressive who blah, 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 blah. Basically narrating what they want the ad to say. Sometimes they'll go as far as to say, uh, this this message needs to reach women 55 plus who live in the East Bay. Like basically telling the super PAC, please buy these ads in these places. It's... You know, and it's seen by campaign finance uh, reformers as, you know, if not illegal because the FEC is not cracking down, totally again makes a mockery, the New York Times has said, of campaign finance law. Aaron Regenberg had claimed he didn't do this with his family super PAC, but Sabina Matos had receipts this week and found that he did, which led to the debate exchange. And why don't we take a listen? This is Sabina Matos going after Regenberg in that debate. Let's don't forget this. You lied about it. You thought you had deleted every record of it from the internet, and we were able to find it. We have not been dishonest about anything. In a debate, I should have chosen my words more carefully about a complicated topic. The Lieutenant Governor has a page on her website that is extremely similar on, to the page Anna, she's attacking. Anna, all right, that was the Providence Journal uh, Public Radio debate uh, where the uh, Matos went after Regenberg on that. So Ted explained it. It's, a, it's sort of nebulous, I think, to people. Does, does the red box scandal resonate with voters? I'm not sure. I think it's really confusing. And actually, my colleague Ed Fitzpatrick and I tried to write, we wrote an explainer this week, like, what's a red box, essentially, yeah, yeah. so people can understand why this keeps coming up. So that exchange right there was him sort of backtracking on what he had said at our debate at Roger Williams University, where Matos asked him if he had a red box on his website, and he said no. And she said, did you ever have a red box? And he said no. And so he was now saying, oh, I should have, um, there's more nuance. I should have been more clear. And to be clear, other candidates have red boxes on their website. It's not just Aaron Regenberg. The accusation is that he took his down and then he was dishonest about it. So maybe that means that he coordinated with the super PAC that was funded by his family members. Never yeah, it's like, <laughs> yes. But I don't know. I, I don't know how much voters understand or care about this. <laughs> it's confusing. Yeah. I agree with Steph totally. I don't think the voters really care about it that much. It's complicated where with, with Matos, with the signatures, dead people signed the paper. People understood that. But this is a lot more complicated, and we're running out of time. So if it hasn't sunk into the voters yeah, now, but it look, might not. Even if you don't understand what the Red Box scandal is and the nuances to it and why it's problematic, you see an exchange like that, and you have Sabina Matos going, you lied on a debate stage. That's some... Even if you don't understand it, that's a moment right. for the, well, uh, the opposing candidate. I think we have to see what happens this week at the debate, because now it's on TV. The other debates they've had so far have not been on regular TV channels. So now the audience is going to be a lot bigger. And if she does it, maybe it will have an impact. Up to this point, I'm not sure how much of an impact it's had. Well, actually, we're going to get a little advice from our own Steph Machado, who moderated. It's <laughs> not our own anymore. We have to get rid of it. Oh, we yeah, that's right. That hurts. <laughs> the Boston Globe, Steph Machado, uh, about how to moderate a debate with that many candidates. The most I've ever done is six candidates. You had 10 on that yep. stage, right? All right, so we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to hear how you were able to herd cat uh, <laughs> in moderating that debate. And we're going to get updated numbers uh, on where money stands in the first congressional race. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White, a political roundtable. Of course, 12 News politics editor Ted Nisi, 12 News political analyst Joe Fleming, and from the Boston Globe, Steph Machado. We are talking about the first congressional race to replace Congressman David Cicilline. Let's take a look at the 12 Democrats vying to replace him. There they are on the screen. We don't have enough time left in the program to name all of them. Uh, uh, it's helpful to go to the web our website, WPRI.com, where we have candidate profiles, so you can get to learn uh, all of these candidates here. Steph, you and your Boston Globe colleague, Ed Fitzpatrick, moderated a debate at Roger Williams University in Bristol earlier this month. Ten candidates were on that stage. That is an unusual number of people yep. to wrangle on the stage. As I said in the first half, the most I've ever done, I think, is six. 
How did you and Ed decide to approach this one? Do you have any advice for Ted and I? As we <laughs> get to ready be for clear, it? everything I've ever learned about moderating a debate is from the two of you, <laughs> but none of us have done one with this many no. candidates. And so we actually went and watched, either in person or, or on the live stream, all the other forums that had taken place so far in the race. And we noticed that the moderators were asking really open-ended questions that were allowing each candidate to sort of go on, you know, filibuster, filibuster and go on with their talking points for two, three minutes. And then at that point, you've, you've asked three questions. The debate is over because you got to get through mm-hmm. 10 to 12 candidates, depending on how many were invited to these various forums. So we really narrowed in on specific questions where we, first of all, thought like that binary there, questions up or down kind of. Yeah, where we thought that there first of all might be daylight between the candidates <laughs> since nine of them agree on almost everything. And when it comes to, you know, big picture and then, yeah, questions that you, you had to give us a clear answer and you couldn't just and we were very clear with them that they had to be concise, that we would cut them off. And they pretty much obeyed, um, you know, for example, What's the first two white rule debates, <laughs> obey the moderator. Exactly. <laughs> you know, for example, you know, do you think the RICAS mandate, which is a federal mandate for standardized testing in, in public schools, should be scrapped, and what would you replace it with? So, you know, things that required a very specific answer. If they started droning on about education is so important, we said, are you going to scrap the mandate? You know, so so really tried to keep them on topic and ask questions that were going to garner something that they could answer in 15 seconds. So, Joe, we have a debate coming up on Tuesday. It's mm-hmm. a live prime time debate, 7 o'clock from Rhode Island College. Ted and I will be moderating that. How important are debates like this in a, in a race that's so crowded? Well, I think we could look back to the governor's primary in 2022. Helena Folk stood out there. It wasn't as many candidates, but she stood out and really closed and almost won the Democratic primary. I think some of these candidates who are trailing are looking to have a breakout moment Tuesday night. It's going to be very tough with nine candidates on stage, but if one of them could have a breakout moment, it could propel them, especially if we're talking a small turnout. People are already voting in this race. So you have to really get the people coming out on election day to vote. And again, you've got to look for that breakout, and it's going to be very difficult. But it could be very important in this debate. Did anyone have a breakout in your debate? You think I know it's tough as a moderator. You're sort of trying to keep track. But. Yeah, I mean, we certainly allowed them to engage with each other and debate with each other. I know some of the other forums that said you, you weren't – there was one that said you couldn't even na- you I know. name I, another I, candidate. I don't understand I don't. That. I didn't agree with that. I thought Sabina Matos – went on the attack on multiple people, even unprompted on topics that we hadn't asked about. And so I thought that that was sort of a a light bulb moment for me that like, oh, she must have something in her internals that she's concerned about, uh, concerned about that she feels that she needs to attack not only Aaron Regenberg, but but Gabe Gabe Amo and others. I just add too. If you look back at the first half of the show, you can also, in a debate, it's not about uh, the reaction necessarily in the hall that night, that moment. It's when you unpin a grenade that explodes on you a few days later, which is what happened to Aaron Regenberg, because Sabina Matos clearly had decided, I'm going to pin him down on this red box thing and see if he tells the truth. As, as everyone is saying, and I agree, I don't think the voters are sitting at home like, mm, I'm a red box voter, like, who's, who stands yeah. where? Yeah. <laughs> but when she got the headline Monday or Tuesday, yep. uh, you know, I say Aaron Regenberg lied and here's my proof. That was a clean hit in politics on Aaron Regenberg that forced him, as Steph said, to backtrack the next day. So that's the other thing with debates. If you say something that – ask Jerry Ford what, when he said that thing about Eastern Europe. I mean, it can ricochet for days after the debate. Yeah, so that was a good moment for you her. You can't ask Jerry Ford. Rest in peace. But <laughs> <Yeah>. like, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. Um, and these debates, too. I mean, you have – There are the candidates that have more money than others. Don Carlson has the most amount of money. We're going to get to that in a moment. And Sabina Matos and Aaron Regenberg has has done some fundraising. Debates like this are opportunities, right, Joe, for the candidates that don't have a lot of money to get that free airtime that they just can't buy. Absolutely. They have to have the free airtime. They have to stand out in the debate. Those people will say, wait a minute, now this person I never heard of, but he sounds really good or she sounds really good. And I'm going to give them a look before I go vote the next time. This is some of these people's only chance to stand out these debates because they don't have the resources to do direct mailing, don't have the resources to do television, and don't have the resources for a strong ground game. Mm. And I'd also point out, uh, and I say it with great respect because it's not easy to figure out how to do this, our uh, arch rivals over in Cranston who are doing their televised debate late in the week decided to split the candidates over two days and not in the evening. And again, I'm not saying that with criticism, just saying 
I do think that only raises the stakes further since now our debate is just by definition the only evening with everyone at once. And I, what's interesting about that debate is that they're not putting the front runners all in one day together. They're doing mm. a random drawing. Mm. And so you might not have the four the front exchange. runners right. in the same debate with uh, each I didn't other. Know that. Yeah. Okay, that's Which is what happened uh, with, with the. And again, no criticism. It's, no, it's, it's, this it's like is impossible why to figure out what to do. Uh, it's one of the reasons reporters, again, to peel back the curtain a little. I've had people, uh, you know, tease me on Twitter for being lazy when I say, oh, we still have so many candidates. It's not actually laziness. It's that it, it is hard as reporters a lot of noise. to vet that mm -hmm. many people yes. mm -hmm. simultaneously and then do it in a way that the voters feel they can follow. Whereas when you get down to three to four strong candidates, I do think the voters and the reporters can kind of keep track of everybody and all of that. Um, and so... But again, that's, the moderators are faced with a difficult choice. There will be downsides to us having everyone on mm. together, as mm. you saw, Steph. Yeah, well, exactly. we, we should be clear, the people coming to our debate will be those that meet our parent company, yes. Nextstar's criteria, which is on our website, WPRI.com. Ted, late night for you last night, <laughs> as there were a campaign, uh, and we're, we're not taping. Not the toddler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this time, not the toddler. We're taping right. this on a Friday morning, so when a lot of you at home are watching this, likely on a Sunday, much can happen in a campaign like this, so there could have been some changes after we taped this program. But last night, uh, campaign finance uh, filing deadline, I read your piece uh, this morning when I woke up, and one thing that stood out to me is all these candidates, maybe except for one, they're running out of money. Yeah, and look, um, in an open congressional primary, especially one this crowded, uh, you know, this, again, is what I saw in the 4th District of Massachusetts, you're not an incumbent. Uh, you're not, and there's no one here who has, like, Gina Raimondo-level fundraising skills. Mm. We remember Raimondo, I remember once, Tim, you and I, uh, in her first run, were tr when I was first here at Channel 12, we were trying to make a graphic of Gina Raimondo's fundraising versus her this. rival, and we were trying to figure out something that didn't look comical, because she was raising so much more money that you couldn't see the amount her rival had uh, raised, which just to say that was very unusual. No one's like that in this race. Um, and so you're down to basically of all the, I will say, major candidates, the ones in uh, double digits in the Regenberg, in the AMO poll, are down to less than $200,000 cash on hand. Uh, the exception is the fifth of the candidates who've gone on TV, Don Carlson, who is largely self-funding and has 266000 But of course, as I'm sure we're going to talk about, there are other questions right now about the Carlson campaign. Joe, fundraising is a challenge, full stop. But even, even more so when you have 12 candidates and uh, the pie of money that you have, that slice is so much smaller for yes, each of these candidates. What's happening in this race is a lot of local people, they're saying, I know like half of these candidates, so they're giving to all these candidates. But just a little bit. A little bit to each candidate. Well, I would normally give maybe $2,000 in a congressional race. Well, I'm dividing that now up among six candidates, so that it's getting smaller and smaller. Particularly when a lot of them are going to still be in office on September 6th exactly. when they lose. So you don't want them to be mad at you when they are... A Chair of a Senate committee or a House committee. <laughs> well, that's or... why so many big people aren't having endorsed, right? The exactly. Governor McKee, Speaker Shikarchi, the mm -hmm. Democratic Party. Didn't Mayor happen? Smiley say it would be bad for Providence for yes. him to pick sides <laughs> right. here? Yeah. Yeah. Something yes. like, I have a lot of friends <laughs> yeah. running. Yeah. Um, so one other thing I want to touch on, uh, Target 12 this past week revealed that Williams College informed Don Carlson in 2019 he would not be welcome back to teach after the administration there were shown some text messages that he sent uh, to a student that officials deemed were inappropriate and crossed the line of a professor-student uh, relationship. I suppose the question here in the first part is sort of obvious, is what are the political impacts of this report? And Steph, does it blunt in any way the signature scandal for Sabina Matos? Sure. I think the signature scandal right now is sort of on pause news-wise because the only thing that we're waiting on is the criminal investigation at the attorney general's office. This is a new scandal. There's another candidate with a scandal. Um, again, we don't because we don't have public polling, we don't know exactly where he landed in the ranking at the time that your report came out. But if you're a voter who already had barely heard of this guy, he didn't have name recognition before this race, you see that there's a scandal, you might say, okay, well, let me look at the other candidates. Yeah, but he has money, um, yep, so he, he can try to re redefine that. It, it, one thing I heard uh, this week, since you referenced it, is Peter Narona, the attorney general, uh, said it is very unlikely that they will wrap up this criminal investigation um, before the September 5th primary. That's not surprising, knowing how long criminal investigations mm -hmm. take. Is that good news for Sabina Matos? I think the damage has already been done. Look uh. at the poll that um, the campaign just came out with. She, her, she has a high and negative, and she has favorables at this point. With so Democratic, I, with Democratic primary, primary voters, yeah. likely voters. So, I mean, the damage has been done. Whether this 
in the indictment comes out before or after, I think it's mute, mute because if there is one, if there is one, and I will, one. I will say this, and I, uh, uh, you know, in a primary like this, you could see a comeback, and it'll be quite a story if Sabina yeah. Matos comes back from all this and wins this Democratic primary. And I, yeah. I never rule anything out in politics. That said, if it doesn't go that way, if Aaron Regenberg or Gabe Baum or someone else is successful, um, I have already heard from people at State House who are wondering. Uh, who think she'll have a lot of work to do to rebuild her political standing. She'll still, of course, be the lieutenant governor uh, with three years left. Mm-hmm. But, again, she's going to, instead of coming out of this race as a member of Congress, she's now coming out of this race underwater with her own party because of the signature scandal. Uh, we have seen candidates before who were terribly damaged. Uh, David Cicilline comes to mind, who did the work to rebuild their standing. She will have time to do that as LG if she's not successful in this primary. But um, certainly, I think you suddenly have more people thinking about, could she be vulnerable in the 2026 LG primary? Very far away, but Mm. that's how politics is. Joe, 20 seconds or less, if you could. Uh, How many people have cast a ballot so far? So far, they have returned about little 4,200 with 2,000 mail ballots and 2,200 early voting. Early voting only has like six more days to go since we're taping on a Friday. Do you still think it'll be a turnout of about 30,000? It looks that way to me at this point. Maybe a little higher, a little lower. Again, it depends on how good the ground organizations are getting them out because I don't think there's a lot of enthusiasm out there for this race at all. All right, a reminder, this coming week, Ted and I will be moderating a live primetime debate among Democratic candidates in the first congressional race. Catch it live next Tuesday or this coming Tuesday at 7 o'clock right here on WPRI 12. You can also watch it live on WPRI.com. For Ted Nisi, Joe Fleming, Steph Machado, thank you for watching it. If you missed it, it's on WPRI.com. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.